We're going to talk about uh, the fourth. This is the fourth way we can affect the reaction rate. We already talked about how the nature of the reactants, allotropes, you know, powdering them, increasing the surface area, stuff like that, dissolving in water. That helps. That's one. We also talked about how the temperature, heating them up, pushing them over the hill, helps. And we also talked about how catalysts help. And I hope you read, you probably didn't, but you should before the test comes, uh, that section on heterogeneous catalysts, specifically on the catalytic converter. Those are three good ways. But the fourth one is what we're going to spend the rest of the chapter on. Why? Because it's got numbers in it. We're going to use concentrations, okay? And it seems to just make sense. Concentration increases. We're going to get faster reactions. That makes sense. No one's going to argue with that. But there's a, another side to this coin. There's a corollary to that. Something you don't realize, even though it should be obvious. There's a problem with that, you'll see. Let me show you. <laughs> okay, watch. Say I have this, exam this equation going on. A plus B yields C. Two guys getting together making a compound. I, you, I'm going to look at this reaction as it happens over time. Okay? So initially, and you don't have to make boxes here. I only did this so they'll come up the way I wanted them to come up. Okay? Initially, you do have to write initial and all the numbers in here. Just don't make it a box. All right? Initially, I put into the beaker one mole of A and one mole of B. One molar of A one molar of B. And before they actually react, so i got my two uh, beakers here. Before they've actually hit, i got one mole of A and one mole of B. How much C do I have before they actually get together? How much C do I have before they've reacted? Zero. Okay. Now, over time, let's say we wait time x, whatever x is. x could be a millisecond, it could be five minutes, it could be an hour. Depends on how fast or how slow the reaction is. But after a certain time x, I've used up half of the uh, reactants. Now, the first question I'm going to ask you here is how much, so if I have 0.5 moles of A and 0.5 moles of B were used up, how much C did I make? No. And that's what I always get. I did not get one mole of C. Let me show you why. Did you want me to say that? No, uh, several people. I in the last period, too. Look, at one carbon atom, one oxygen atom make how many carbon monoxides? One. See, one plus one doesn't equal two when it comes to chemical reactions. One A plus one B gives me one C. So 0.5 A's, 0.5 B's is going to give me 0.5 C's. Because that's what stoichiometry means. But it is a common mistake for people to say that, thinking you're going to add them together. But that's not what's weird about this. That always happens, and I correct it. That's not the problem. Here's the problem. You might think now, after time 2x, these numbers will be 0, 0, and 1, right? Sure. But it's not. Well, why not? Why not? Because of the other side of this statement. If, as you all agree... Increasing the concentration of the, of the reactants increases the rate, then decreasing the concentration of the reactants must do what? Decrease the rate. Do I have, from this point here to that point there, the same concentration? I have half the concentration. So from here to here, how fast is that reaction going now? Half as fast. So how much of this will I actually have after time 2x? Exactly. That's the weird part of this. So you think you multiply it by two. Exactly. But you don't. Because it, and you can tell right now. By the way, how much of the C will I have? 0.25. No, well, 0.25 more than the 0.5 I had, so 0.75. All right, now look at it. You know I can keep doing this. Times 4x, times 8x, times whatever. And what's going to happen to my concentrations? They're going to approach zero, right? And that's what kind of what, what does that remind you of in uh, your math class? Yeah, it's an exponential decay. It's exactly right. Yeah, uh, very good. And you may in calculus know that you would have to calculate you know derivatives based on this. Yeah. All right. Now it's okay. Don't worry. I know most of you aren't in calculus and haven't taken it. And I'm not going to do this by calculus, but you could. All right. My point is this: everyone knows what the shape's going to look like, right? Everyone knows it's going to be like approaching zero, like a curved shape, uh, a hyperbola, right? Uh, and the reason for that is 
this other side of this coin. The rate of the reaction decreases as the reactants are used up. So basically, you're getting a reaction that approaches zero. Now, by the way, in math class, things approach zero and never reach it. In chemistry, they do reach zero. Why? <clears throat> Who can figure out why? Well, let's just say I start in a math class. If I start out with the numbers are like <clears throat> 10 and 10, and I want to cut them in half every time. Half of 10 is 5. Half of 5 is 2.5. Half I can keep going to decimals and have 0 0.0000000 whatever. Can I do that with atoms? If I cut this in half, I'll have five atoms. I cut it in half again, I'll have two and a half atoms. Or two, I can't have half an atom, though. So I'd have either two or three atoms. Cut it in half again, I'd have one atom. One more time, I'm done. I'm out of atoms. They've all reacted now. See, I do reach zero in chemistry class. You don't reach zero in math class, all right? Um, because you're actually dealing with real things in chem. All right, so finally, the rate, since the rate of the reaction decreases as the reactants are used up, what happens is, you basically get uh, a nonlinear uh, decay. It does not change in a linear fashion. And that's a big deal. You know, in Chem 1, I, all I did was mention these ways of increasing the rate of the reaction, and that's it. You know, look at all the extra stuff we've already done with it. And now we're about to spend the rest of the chapter on mathematically trying to describe these changes. It's based on concentration and other things, too. All right. So let's graph this now. All right. I think you all, again, I think most of you know what's going to happen, but graphing it is another story. And it, just like you have little mistakes there, you're going to have other mistakes again. I can measure the rate based on how fast or how, uh, how fast the reactants are used up or how fast the products are formed. Okay. What will I measure about it? In, in geometry class, what do we call, if I graph it, what we measured, it would be the same thing as the rate. I want you to think about that for a second. Well, let's just graph it. Maybe it'll, it'll, it'll become clear as I graph it. We're going to take a real, a real life equation this time, <clears throat> not just A plus B yields C. And we'll take coefficients in here as well. So that's my equation. I'm going to graph this on uh, a chart of concentration on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. All right, And we're going to graph these guys underneath each of these, make this legend. I'm going to use different colors to make it a little easier for you to see. But underneath this, I want you to use different things uh, representing each of these um, chemicals. A circle will represent the N2O5. A triangle will represent the NO2. And a square will represent the O2. And I'll see if you could put these all in the right places as I make this graph. And I even, here, I even have the how many pages, how many lines of the page you have to leave. Okay, if that's your page, you want to have that many lines. And make your graph just like that. And fill it in just like that. Oh, and you don't really need, all you have to put at the bottom is just time. You don't have to put time one, time two, time three. Time zero is here, and then the end here. The other way. All right, make that, and then we'll talk about it. All right, first off, I throw into my beaker two moles. I'm going to use stoichiometric amounts now. So I'm going to throw in two moles of N2O5 into my beaker, okay, into my one liter container. All right. Before it starts to react, before it starts to decompose into NO2 and O2, all right, I have two moles of N2O5. So you're going to make your circle. I'm going to make it red right here. That's the beginning. Where will my triangle and square be in the beginning before they start to, it starts to react? Zero, down here, right? So at time zero, before it reacts, my blue triangle and my black square are at zero. And my red reactant, N2O5, 
I have two moles of. Now, I also know where these guys are going to end, don't I? And all we wanted you to figure out is where we're going to put, what we're going to put in between them. Where are they going to end? Where's the red one going to end? At the end of the reaction, how much N2O5 will I have? Zero. So he'll be down here. At the end of the reaction, how much of the, tri where will the triangle be? How much NO2 will I have? Where am I going to put my blue triangle? Four, right? Because I'm using stoichiometry here, okay? So up here, there's my blue triangle. And what about my black square? Where is he going to be? One. Okay. All right. So I know where I began, and I know where I'm going to end up. Here's the big question. What does it look like in between? Now, I know you. I, I, we've just talked about what happens, but can you fill this in correctly? Let's take a look at just the red one first. Is it going to look like this? Is it going to look like this? Or is it going to look like this? <coughs> Football. <laughs> It's going to be curved, so we can ignore the first one. We're going to ignore the middle one, right? All right. Which way is it going to be curved? I want you to think. What happens in the beginning when there's lots of the reactants, what's going to happen? It's going to react faster, right? So it's going to drop really fast. Let's just go back to my same uh, example I did a little while ago. Think about this. Um, if in the beginning... He's dropping very quickly. See, between here and here, it's happening, and you get rid of half of the stuff. All right, so it goes from two down to one here. What's it going to do between the next two time interval? So half of that, half of that, half of that, right? So you all agree that the, gra the graph is probably going to look like this. And that's how you should draw it. Right? Yeah. Okay, now, what about the other guys? How are they going to look? Again. Is it going to be like this? Or is it going to be like this? What do you think? Over. Yeah. Matter of fact, I've got them all worked out here. That's how that guy looks. By the way, you make a nice smooth line. This is, in order for it to show up, it makes individual lines between them. The uh, blue one would look like that. Again, smooth curving line. And the black one would look like that. And that makes sense? In the beginning, it happens very quickly, but as time goes on, it peters out. Peters out. That's a good word. Um, right here. Now, in lab, we are going to measure the concentration of products being formed, usually a gas, although in one of the labs it's not. Usually a gas we measure. How much is good? The problem with this is, if I ask you what's the rate of the reaction, the rate of the reaction is the change in the concentration over the change in time. Does that have a special name in math? What do we call it? The slope. The change in y over the change in x. But the problem with this slope is what? It's changing. See, the slope here is very steep, but over time, the slope is less steep, right? As a matter of fact, the slope is constantly changing. That's why you need calculus to calculate it, right? The derivative. It's not really the slope. The slope would be for a straight line. I could just calculate one number, the slope, right? Now, we are not going to use calculus. So what we're going to do, if I take a small portion of, the, of a curved line, okay? All right, if I take a small portion of that, what is it basically like? Kind of like a straight line. So that's what we're going to be using. We'll use a small piece of it at the same time to do our labs, and we can just calculate the regular slope, change in y over change in x. But in reality, we're cheating. Okay, When we plug it into our calculators, you're going to need graphing calculators. When you plug them in there, I have some extras if you need them. Uh, you, we're going to do a linear regression line. But in reality, you guys probably know even how to do this on your, on your uh, graphing calculators. You can actually trace on the line any spot and get the slope at that point. You know how to do that, anybody? Anybody do that in their graphing calculators yet? probably does it, but I don't know how to It's not that hard, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to take a linear regression line, have it get the slope for us. And we get really good results from that lab, by the way. All 
All right, so y'all understand what's going on then? Yep. All right, let's just put this into words. Uh, basically, the rate of the reaction is the slope. No, I didn't mess up yet. Did you? Oh, yeah, it, it, it's coming. All right. It's coming. Oh, it's coming. Oh, it's coming. All right. It wasn't a matter of messing up. Well, I'm not So the slope is the tangent at, uh, to the curve. The slope of the tangent to the curve at any given point is the actual um, rate of the reaction. Because the rate of the reaction is the change in concentration over the change in time. Okay, change in y over the change in x. This was Shania's. What does conk mean? So that kind of set me. Oh, I thought she would have done something on the graph. No, no, it wasn't. It's not about. It's always. It's never about stupidity. I'm not gonna make fun of you for being dumb. I'm gonna make fun of you for being an idiot. <laughs> there's, there's a difference. The difference is asking a question you know the answer to, you know, or a misspelled word, and uh, and, and it's I don't understand. What do you mean? Because you misspelled the word, you couldn't tell. Or B slash N, not knowing that's between. That's pretty bad. That was yesterday too. The conch, seriously? Anyway. Uh, all right, so there's a problem, guys. If I have to use the reactants, i got to take the negative of that value. You see why? Let's go back. After you copy that down, I'll go back and show you that the graph for the reactants, look what happens with the slope. Okay, if you're familiar with a little bit of geometry, a little bit of a um, trig. trig. I suppose. What is slope based? That's geometry, isn't it? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. 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 Anyway, take a look back here. I'll go back to it in a second. If I'm using uh, a, a product, it's not a problem. The slope is positive, right? But if I'm using a, a reactant, what's the slope now? It's negative. it's negative. So I have to take the negative value of that to get the reactants, uh, to get the actual uh, rate. Okay. Well, that's good. All right, so that's basically it. Now, that just kind of explains to you what's going on. On the test, I'm going to show you this graph and ask you questions about it, and you should understand it. In the lab, we're going to make a graph very similar to this, uh, uh, not of all three things, but just of one of them, and use it to predict, the, not predict, but to measure the rate of the reaction. Okay? All right, so that's the, we're, we kind of need to know that. But we're finally getting to the math part of it, and that's why I'm actually, normally, uh, uh, it's not long enough, this isn't long enough for a whole period, and the next period is really long. So I'm actually going to start something now that I um, really will continue and finish tomorrow and explain, because it involves me to move this camera, too.